Um, do you do the same? Do you use this whole same process for your Alcatraz novels? Uh, no, my Alcatraz novels are um, are free written books, and so let's talk about other methods of write uh, of building stories. Um, Now, I believe I mentioned the Kevin J. Anderson method, which is the start and write out a really detailed description of your book. And then you take that and you take it one step <coughs> and you put it into viewpoint. And then you take that and you take it one step further and do a more detailed outline. And then finally, you write the scenes where you take each kind of paragraph and say, this is a scene and write your book. Um, I've never tried that method before, but I do know um, many authors who use it. Um, the method I use for the Alcatraz books is, um, I, I, I say, is somewhat like, um, you guys seen that show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's like, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Um, with the Alcatraz books, my goal with the books <coughs> is, number one, they're only one viewpoint books. Number of view, viewpoints you're going to use magnifies the complexity of your book um, many fold. All right? For new writers, I suggest try and stick to two or three viewpoints maximum. If you're writing a YA book, do one or two, okay? If you're doing epic fantasy, maybe let yourself have four, but <coughs> remember something like, you know, the Wheel of Time. Big, massive, epic scope. <coughs> the first book was halfway through before it added a second viewpoint because the complexity of the world is so big that um, adding a lot of different viewpoints right off the bat can, can, can just can just make things explode for you. So as an early writer, I once said, I'm going to write a book, I'm going to use 12 main characters, and they're all going to have their own cool plots and be doing different things. The book was a disaster, okay? So that's a little aside. The, um, the idea here is that if... I don't want to say don't be ambitious, because you want to be ambitious, but if you think about it this way, and I will get to the answer to this, um, how, do I, how do I do Alcatraz books, but if you think of it this way, you think of, let's say, your writing skill is right here, you know, on, on some arbitrary scale. This is where you are. And if you shoot for a book that's like right here in your skill level, the book is going to turn out, let's, let's you know, how's it going to turn out whether if you point, if you shoot to, for one like this. And let's say you were going to write these two hypothetical books. This one turns out just wonderfully, even though it's in smaller in scope, and this one turns into a train wreck. This one is going to be a better book, even though you may look at that and say, oh, but it's less ambitious, it's less complex. Well, sometimes taking the thing that's just you know, challenging you enough to make it um, really interesting, yet not so grand in scope that it's going to train wreck, can actually step your skill level up a bit. Um, it's, it's, it's like saying, um, you know, let's, let's say that you, you, you weigh 120 pounds, you're like, I'm going to go fight in the heavyweight division because that's where the real champions are. Well, no, it's, you know, you can, uh, there are fantastic books of small scope. Pride and Prejudice is a very small scope book. It's a wonderful novel, okay? There's, you know, you, you don't look at Pride and Prejudice and say, well, yes, but, you know, it doesn't have the cast that something like uh, Game of Thrones has. They're doing completely different things. And so it's not, even though, you know, the number of viewpoints might make this one more ambitious, this one is um, an equally good or better book, in my opinion, because of, what, it's, what it, it, it's trying to achieve and how well it achieves it. And so saying, um, yeah, I'm not saying don't be ambitious, but I am saying sometimes it's best to try and look and say, I'm gonna write a really great book at this level of ambition rather than write a mediocre book at this level of ambition until I get better. I say that because of personal experience. Um, this, this helped me become a better writer when I kind of stepped it up. Um, the books that I tried at this level of ambition when I was a newer writer really turned out to be horrible and I didn't learn as much as the books like Elantris, which Elantris is a, a smaller scope ambition book than something like Way of Kings. Um, and yet there are plenty of people that like Elantris more because ambition is not the only thing that makes a good book. It's only one factor of many that can make for a good book, all right? So keep that in mind. Um, but, so, with um, Alcatraz, only having one viewpoint means that I don't have to worry about the detailed plot outline as much because, you know, we're, our, our scale of complexity is going to remain relatively simple. One direct plot line, <coughs> 
it's going to be sequential and chronological. We're not going to do time jump, um, jumps and things like that, which add a lot of complexity. Um, and I'm going to kind of only have two or three set piece scenes, meaning we're going to be in this location and then this location and then maybe this location. So what that allows me to do is to do some, um, to write the books much more free form for me. So what I do with them is I sit down and I say, okay, I'm going to give myself the grab bag brainstorming session. I'm going to take just a couple of days. I'm going to brainstorm just wacky, screwy, interesting things that make me laugh. Sorry about that. You, you, you've been warned. Um, that make me laugh. And then I am going to try and write a book where they all make sense. Okay? So I'll sit down and say, okay, we're going to come up with new smedgery talents. Uh, if you haven't read the books, um, these are books about people who have their magical powers or stupid things that, um, that people do, like, you know, one person's magically good at arriving late to appointments, and, you know, another person's magically good at tripping, stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to brainstorm cool lenses. Um, uh, lenses, uh, they have magical glasses that do cool things. Um, and then I'm going to come up with random elements. Kind of like, you know, in whose line they'll like draw it and say, okay, tell a story using a tangerine and, <coughs> you know, a wet noodle. Um, this is what I'll do. I'll be like, okay, talking dinosaurs. Um, and <coughs> a bad guy made of little pieces of metal. And, you know, I'll just, all of these random things, I'll end up taking about two-thirds of them, saying, okay, I've got to tell a story with all of these elements that, that feels cohesive, it makes sense. Go. Oh, and it has to be funny. Um, <laughs> and then I'll just go, chapter by chapter, and see and try and get these things all in and hit all these points by the end of the story. Um, it's a real fun writing method. It, um, it creates for a lot of spontaneity, but it also is very silly. So it's most... Um, suited to a middle grade type book. Um, the reason for that being, the older we get, <coughs> the more we want our silliness and our seriousness separated, it seems to be. Um, while as a middle grade kid will read an action adventure book with a lot of silliness and still, um, still enjoy it as a serious book, um, it's harder to pull that off unless you're Terry Pratchett for adults. Um, it really is. Uh, you know, I, I, and that's why you end up with something um, more like a <coughs> Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is really crazy, but really does not have anything in the way of compelling characters um, or a compelling plot. It's just humor. Just In saying just humor, I mean, it's brilliant. It's great humor, but it is just humor. Um, it's not doing um, a lot of things. Pratchett somehow manages to take it and have a good plot and some decent characters and the humor together. Um, he's the only one I've read that can do that. Um, but anyway, um, if that's your bag, then go for it. Um, but remember, for, uh, um, for adults, generally, humor is not random elements mixed together the way it is um, for kids. Taking, you know, say, if you say, to, if I write in an Alcatraz book, my penguins are on fire, they laugh. <coughs> They're like, why do you have penguins and why are they on fire? That's hilarious. Um, <laughs> that's not generally going to be as funny for adults. Um, adults are going to be looking for word plays or, um, or dramatic irony or these types of humor that are not as um, well suited to this kind of random brainstorming thing I do for Alcatraz. Okay? So, uh, question for you guys. Um, have you used other methods of kind of generating a story and getting started that I haven't talked about? If so, tell me about them and let's talk about them with the class. Um, I'll give you a gummy bear. Yeah. Um, I once had a friend who was trying to encourage me to write and so she said, um, why don't you tell me a story? Touch on, uh, it was on Facebook. She said, why don't you tell me a story? So I just told her a story, and then she was like, oh, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. Tell okay, me more. yeah. So it, just, it was basically a free write, but it was because um, I had an audience. Right. I, I knew when she was excited okay. what would bore her and stuff. Okay, considering audience. Um, that can be very useful. Um, I just talked about that a little with the Alcatraz books, um, and we will talk about... Um, the different genre divisions. In fact, maybe we'll talk about that today because that is kind of on my list of things to talk about. Um, but yeah, considering audience, what, uh, what else do we got? I'm going to throw your gummy bear at this hand that I didn't cough on. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, how I wrote my, well, just the one novel, yeah. I, for some reason it was Christmas Eve and I just thought of this really <clears throat> engaging dialogue and I said, uh -huh. I have to write this down. Okay. And then I just started asking those questions going back with the plot basically. Well, what brought them to this point? Uh -huh. And I just started, kept going. 
I wrote a novel out of that. Awesome. Um, I once uh, challenged uh, followers of me on, on Twitter um, to do a dialogue exercise, which is very fun, which is they try to write a story with three or, or more characters in which you use no dialogue tags, a scene, not really a story, in which you use no dialogue tags, but which you differentiate each character by the way they speak. Um, and that could be, if you're having trouble starting, a good way to go. Say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come up with three characters. I'm going to come up with different ways that they talk. Not necessarily dialect. Dialects, you know. Dialect, yes, but not like um, Cockney accent dialect that you write on the page. You know, not Mark Twain type, type dialect, but more, you know, this person favors compound sentences. Or this person always uses, like Robert Jordan does this, fishing metaphors. You know, it's a woman from, a, from a, 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 a fishing background, and even though she's like one of the most powerful women and most cultured women now, she always uses fish, fishing metaphors, and it's great um, because she, you know, she'll start using these complex fishing metaphors that no fisherman would ever come up with, but they're still about you know, chopping off the fish head as being a metaphor for, you know. And so that's a great way to characterize someone just through dialogue. And you could do something like this, build your characters so they each have a different way of talking. Maybe one of them um, uses um, you know, very direct, blunt speech, and the other one always tries to talk around things and placate everybody. Building a, building a dialogue exercise that way. What else are you guys used? Yes, right here. I usually come up with the character first and then decide what's wrong with them and figure out how they're going to fix that. Excellent. Woo, that was awful. Um, sorry about that throw. OK, what's wrong with them? How to fix it? Um, that's a great way. Um, you know, one of the one of the one of the tools I've seen people use that I like is also the um, what does the character want most and why can't they have it? Oh, um, let's see. One I use not very often, but just kind of making my dreams make a little bit more sense. Okay, dreams. Sure, works fine. Yes. Um, I have younger siblings who are quite a bit younger than me, uh -huh. and they like to draw funny pictures, and I'll just say, "What is that? What does it do? Where does it go? Okay. How does it work?" And by the time we're done, we've we've written a short story together. Excellent. Was there one back here? Um, I was actually gonna, going along the same lines with the. Uh, There's a game of bear coming at you. Amplifies creativity so that. Okay. Sorry, I missed it. What was oh, it? I was actually just going along with what he had oh, said. Oh yeah. About a dream journal. Um, yeah, dream journals are great. <laughs> okay, right here, and then over here, and then we'll go on to something else. Um. I actually, um, one of the things that happened to me recently was, oh dear. <laughs> You're fine. It's under your feet. You'll, you'll get it in a minute. Um, so I had recently a original character idea from a dream. And uh -huh. fortunately, I forgot 99% of the plot in the dream. So that's, so I could just write, rewrite everything. <laughs> dream journals are good, though. Dream journals are useful. Um, all right. Who, who was the last person? You were the last person. I was just the one that there is another novel that I'm writing right now. Oh, okay. That's excellent. Um, in fact, I do that a lot. When um, on my points on the map thing, my big powerful scenes are often come from listening to music while I'm working out um, and devising something to go there. Okay. I'm gonna eat this one because it's red, and you're getting the orange one. Sorry. <laughs> I'm the teacher. I can do that. Um, 